Okay. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Four Minute Mull. It is a warm, lazy Sunday afternoon here in Cape Town. Not the kind of day that I usually post these videos, but then this morning I was just catching up on the final day's action from the Commonwealth Games down at the Gold Coast. And I'm sure like many of you, I saw these very amazing dramatic scenes in the men's marathon where the race leader from Scotland, Callum Hawkins, collapsed at 40 kilometers. He built himself a lead of about just over two minutes on what was a hot day for marathon running. Uh, and then he collapsed, as I said, 40k and spent a number of minutes lying at the side of the road before anyone eventually got some medical support to him. He had to be taken off to the hospital uh, for treatment, where I understand at this point that he's recovering and they're reporting that he's doing okay, which is at least a good thing to start with. But I wanted to spend this four minute mile sharing thoughts in two areas. Number one is what physiology is likely to be going on when an elite athlete collapses on a hot day? And then secondly, some issues around the management and the treatment of the athlete when they do collapse, because there's been some controversy and discussion around how long it took for him to get any support from either spectators or officials and medical doctors with the race organization. So let's get straight into that, starting with the physiology. What you are looking at here is a series of still photographs that I've captured from the video from Callum Hawkins' race this morning. I had wanted to show you the entire two and a half minutes worth of video, but unfortunately YouTube's copyright policies don't allow that, so the stills will have to do. But I think you can still pick up from them, and the point that I want to make by showing them to you is that there is a very characteristic symptom that you see in athletes who are developing heat stroke, and that is the loss of coordination that causes them to stumble, to stagger, and eventually to fall. And so you see that in Hawking's. He's lost the ability to control his limbs and so he stumbles about he can't run in a straight line he eventually falls he picks himself up but very clumsily it's quite clear that his balance has been compromised he then keeps going until eventually his body fails on him entirely or perhaps more accurately it's not his body that fails it's his brain and the reason that the coordination is important is because it implicates the central nervous system rather than the cardiovascular. And so right at the end here, you can see shortly after the 40k mark, he collapses for the final time. He can't pick himself up. He's passed by his rivals and eventually he lies there until the ambulance comes and they take him off to hospital. Now the reason that I emphasize that lack of coordination and that uh, falling down and the, what's clearly implicates the brain is because for many years, Researchers thought that the problem during exercise in the heat was the heart and specifically the cardiovascular system because you can imagine when you're in the heat your body needs to send blood to the skin because it needs to lose that heat and that's one of the ways it does that and it also needs to send blood to the muscles and so there's this tension this tug of war between the skin circulation the cutaneous circulation and the muscle the skeletal muscle. And researchers used to think that that tension was one of the things that compromised performance in the heat. One of the clues that they might actually be wrong about that comes from cases like Hawkins that you've just seen and a number of others. And so this was something observed in both laboratory studies and in real life examples. And it was that this confusion, disorientation, inability to activate muscle, lack of coordination, falling down, those symptoms implicate that maybe it was the brain, the central nervous system, rather than the cardiovascular system that was to blame. And then at the same time, there were some studies coming out showing that despite that tension between the skin and the muscle, the cardiovascular system was actually more than capable of meeting demands. And so the focus very much moved to the brain. And as I say, there were a number of fairly high profile cases. This is one example. It comes from the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games, a very famous one of Gabrielle Anderson, who runs into the stadium looking very much like Callum Hawkins did. She's staggering, she can't run in a straight line, she's lost again the ability to activate and control her muscles. It looks almost as though she's paralyzed on one half of her body. And it eventually takes her just over five minutes to do that final 400 meter lap of the stadium. She makes it and then she's taken off for medical care where she makes a recovery. Here is another example. This time it's 1954 and the famous case of Jim Peters competing in Vancouver in what was then called the Empire State Games, now the Commonwealth Games. 
And you'll see again, very similar presentation to what you saw in Hawkins. He's lost the ability to run. Even walking is a challenge. He's veering off to the side. He actually looks a little bit like someone who's had too much to drink. And the only thing in his head is get to the finish line, but of course he can't. And as you saw there, he eventually collapses and fails to finish that race. Now, what those cases show, as I've explained, is this loss of coordination. So eventually the theory developed, supported by some very good research that was done about 15, 16 years ago, primarily out of Denmark, where they showed that when the athlete exercised in hot conditions, there was obviously a component of heat production. Your muscles are producing heat. In a hot environment, that heat cannot be lost, and the result is that body temperature goes up and up and up and up. Eventually, it reaches what was called the critical level of hypothermia. That was the limiting temperature, limiting body temperature beyond which exercise couldn't continue. And it always looks very much like what you've seen in the case of Hawking's, Peters and Anderson. Loss of coordination, inability to stay upright and run in a straight line. Now, that problem is obviously exacerbated in someone who's not heat adapted. So, for instance, Callum Hawking's coming out of Scotland in March, April, is unlikely to have been exposed to the kinds of temperatures that he would have experienced at the Gold Coast. And so that makes it more likely that his body temperature will rise to reach that critical level of hypothermia. There were a number of really innovative studies at that time also that showed that when your brain reaches that critical level of hypothermia, it loses the ability to activate muscle. And so it activates less muscle and less effectively and efficiently. And that explains why you see athletes present the way that they do. So that's the physiology. Let's talk a little bit now about the management of the case specifically of Callum Hawkins. So the controversy around the Hawkins incident and where much of the discussion has focused is on why did it take the medical support so long to reach him when he collapsed on that bridge at 40 k's. Now this is true no matter what the cause of collapse is, whether it's cardiac or heat stroke or anything else, the quicker the medical support arrives, the better it is. I mean, if that's a cardiac event causing that collapse, then Hawkins' chances of survival are dropping with every minute that goes by. So medical support has to get there quickly. In this specific case, as I've explained to you, the root cause or the problem is that his body temperature has climbed and climbed and climbed and climbed until eventually it's reached these dangerously high levels of hypothermia, maybe 41, potentially 42 degrees Celsius. In those situations, the fundamental immediate priority is you have to cool the athlete down as quickly as possible. So again, medical support must arrive quickly. There's, there's really no excuse for it not to. Especially if you're organizing a race on a hot day, you know that the temperatures are going to be 28, 29, 30 Celsius. You know that athletes are going to be racing hard and potentially they're not adapted and accustomed to the heat. You should therefore expect something like this could happen. And therefore, your provision of medical services, especially in the last 5 to 10 kilometers, have to be so good that at the first sign of a problem, you can send those doctors to accompany that athlete so that they can intervene the moment it becomes clear that they are needed. So I can't understand why it took as long as it did. I think that that is very disappointing. In the opposite direction, I've seen some accusation from the organizers and from people on Twitter saying that the spectators should have intervened, that someone from the crowd should have said, listen, Callum Hawkins, stop. You're only doing more damage to yourself. And it was, it was clear to us watching it on television as we saw this whole thing unfolding that he was doing damage to himself and that he should have stopped sooner. The problem is that a spectator, particularly early on, is seeing that athlete for five seconds. They're, they're seeing what is a snapshot as part of a movie. And I think it's very difficult to ask a spectator to do that. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say that it, it could actually be harmful. And I'm not saying that from the perspective of the athlete's going to get disqualified when he receives help. That's, that's secondary to the health of the athlete. But there are some medical conditions where the spectator's intervention could actually make it worse. And so I would be very cautious about encouraging spectators and crowds at sports events to, from actually intervening for medical reasons. Unless that person in the crowd is a medical doctor and is absolutely confident and certain about what's going on, I don't know that it's reasonable to shift the burden of duty of care to your spectators when it should belong to the organizers. I, as, so as much as I would love to say that we, we should see good Samaritans intervening, 
I don't know that they have the necessary qualifications or the opportunity in this instance to make that determination accurately and safely. And so the solution for me is rather to make sure that your medical support is better and not to shift duty of care onto your spectators. Now, we can debate whether it's in good taste to be filming the guy and taking photos and so forth. That's a separate issue. But medical intervention is the domain of race organizers and qualified race doctors, not spectators. Anyway, that's a wrap for this one. I'm, I'm glad to read that Hawkins has apparently okay and is recovering. I hope that this doesn't have any long-term effects on performance. There is, by the way, a possibility that it does. I remember speaking to an expert on heat stroke a few years back and his, his opinion was that once you've had one, you're never quite the same as an athlete. So I hope that's not the case, but I am glad at least that Hawkins' health is okay for now. That's it for, as I say, this four minute mull. Uh, do join me next time when hopefully we can talk about something other than a medical complication to an elite athlete during sport. Ciao.